Hello, welcome to a very special edition of the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy, and here to wrap up what has been a really fun year with Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Good to see you as always, guys. Hi, Darcy. Nice, Darcy. It is so lovely to be here. Merry Christmas to you. The trees are wrapped, the presents are wrapped, and Santa is about to board his sleigh. It's a magical time of year. Oh, I especially love watching the kids this year. My kids are still young enough to totally be involved in Christmas in that little young age where they get so excited with the presents under the tree. It's so special. It really is the time of the year for the kids, isn't it? And I still remember that feeling and it was the Christmas stocking that was the most exciting thing, even though we knew what was in the bottom. So a ball of string, a mandarin and a florin. What? <laughs> that was your upbringing, Nick. Wait, hang on, hang on. A two-shilling <laughs> yeah. piece before decimalisation, 1971. Oh, it was very Dickensian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some counselling you got, I think, I'm back. Now, we know you, you grew up in the UK. Is it still the traditional... British style, or have you adapted to the seafood Australian Christmas? Well, I'm very lucky because I have a gorgeous niece, Francesca, and her mum, Penny, and they like doing the full Christmas roast, so I'm off the hook when it comes to Christmas lunch. So while we're all waiting for Father Christmas, we're not so keen on the swarms of unwanted guests at the moment, and they are out of control. I'm talking about the mozzies, mm. Joe. Oh, my gosh, they are so bad. I cannot stand the buzzing around your ears when I'm sleeping. I'm sure they're going to fly in there. That freaks me out. And I must say... <laughs> They love me, the mosquitoes. Yeah. I am constant. If, if I'm at a barbecue, they come straight for me. It's that buzzing sound, isn't it? Yeah. It gets right into your head and you think you're going crazy. And this summer, they're out in force. It's, of course, because of all the rain and the floods and the warm conditions that we've had. It's created the perfect breeding ground. And have you noticed this year's mozzies are bigger and there are more of them, particularly in regional New South Wales? And they are annoying, but if you want to get rid of them and repel them, uh, you can forget about those bands, you oh. know, those mosquitoes. They, they really don't work too well. Um, but mosquito nets, they work a fan just to blow the little critters away mm -hmm. and wear light, loose-fitting clothing so the mozzies can't reach your skin. Get rid of any stagnant water because that's where they love to breed and no perfume. Oh. Sorry, girls. That's a shame. <laughs> I, you know, um, we always used to put a little bit of toothpaste on our mozzie bites to stop them from being itchy. Is there any science to that? That's a really good question, Joe. I had to go and look this one up because I didn't know, but it turns out that toothpaste does work. Ah. And it's two things. There's menthol and peppermint, which helps cool, but there's baking soda, which is actually an effective anti-irritant, anti-itch. So toothpaste, it does work. Love it. Mozzies don't bite me at all. Oh, really? It never, ever, ever happens. <laughs> they go berserk for Beck, my wife, so it um, drives her insane. Is there a reason why some people are... There actually is others? a reason for that, because mozzies are attracted to smell, which is why no perfume, and some of us exude the kind of smell mozzies really like, and others like you, Darcy, nah, they're not interested. And they are. <laughs> All the biting ones are female, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so changing tack now to what happens when life begins... And baby brain. I definitely had it. Joe, did you? Oh my gosh, my daughter's 13. I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out that well accepted fuzzy baby brain may be a myth brought about purely because new mums are just too hard on themselves. And new Melbourne research has found no link between having a new baby and memory issues. I actually dispute that though. I found I forgot everything. Well, I also don't think that that's a particularly useful study because the number one thing we need to do is listen to mums and mm. women when they say, I'm experiencing something. Don't dismiss it because, oh, we've got a study. Well, if your experience is different, we need to listen to that. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Joe, because over the years I've seen a fair few conflicting studies. Baby brain is real. No, it's a myth. And for what it's worth, I reckon you mums have to remember so much. You've got so much to do. You've got babies, you've got bottles, you've got snacks. And if you forget something now and then, it's not so much really baby brain as already full brain. Mm, I'm going to be a brave doctor to tell a <laughs> mum that that doesn't exist. I wouldn't think that would be a smart option, Nick, Dr Nick, at any stage. Now, people around the country are getting up ladders and roofs, as we know, to decorate their house and their trees, which means... Yeah, it's a real problem, Darcy. It means GPs and hospitals are gearing up to treat a stack of fall-related injuries. Well, remember a few Christmases ago, Molly Meldrum had a devastating fall while hanging Christmas lights on the roof. And he was actually one of the lucky ones, Joe, because he did survive that, even though it was a serious fall. But they are becoming increasingly common as we get older, and people aged over 65 and over have a 30% chance of falling at least once a year. I think at least one of us on the panel could be in that group. <laughs> and that risk increases to over 50% for those who are 80 plus.
Well, that's interesting, uh, Dr Nick, because New World guidelines have just come out to keep older adults safe and we checked in with physio, Cathy said, to find out how to stay steady on our feet. Falls are a really complex problem, so there's lots of reasons that can contribute to someone's risk of falls, but some of the things that make you more likely to fall include having any problems with your balance or your walking, problems with your vision. We also know that people who take multiple medications are at increased risk of falling, and we do know that people's risk of falling does increase as you get older. Uh, there's extremely good evidence that exercise, that includes balance exercises and uh, some functional exercises. So these are things um, such as uh, practising sitting, uh, getting up from a chair um, or practising going up and down steps, uh, that these actually can significantly reduce your risk of falls. It's a very significant problem. I think one of the things many people don't realise is that uh, more people are hospitalised due to injuries following a fall than are hospitalised due to fin injuries following a road, road trauma. So, uh, you know, it's really a, a very substantial problem for us here in Australia. We know that approximately one in three uh, people over the age of 65 will fall each year, and that increases to around one in two people over the age of 80 will fall each year. And unfortunately, we also know that many people will have more than one fall. So there can be lots of different outcomes after someone has a, a fall. Some people who fall will have some mild injuries, such as bruises or sprains. And unfortunately, we know that there are a number of people who have really very serious injuries, such as fractures or head injuries. And this can lead to them spending quite a significant amount of time in hospital. And in some cases, unfortunately, some people do die as a consequence of their fall. Well, it's come out that walking just 5,000 steps a day could be the key to good health in old age and a big help in stopping falls. So get your steps up. Uh, but, Joe, <laughs> do you know where the 10,000 steps recommendation came from? I don't know, someone who likes to torture us, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was actually originally a marketing ploy by a Japanese pedometer maker back in the 1960s. And they gave it the catchy name Manpo K, which in Japanese just means 10,000 step meter. So it wasn't actually science at all. Now, it's not that there's anything wrong with 10,000 steps, but for most people, six, 7,000, that's all that you need for the most of the health benefits. It's all about finding ways to keep moving and keeping on your feet. After the break, we'll do just that with the exercises that will keep you perfectly in balance. That's next. Before the break, we looked at how falls are the leading cause of hospitalisation for older Australians, Joe, and the key is, as we heard, to keep moving, especially as we age. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be sweating it out over weights or in a full-on cardio class. I love the power of meditation, I love Pilates, and I love walking. I've heard that if you walk a lot and you have to walk with a bit of pace, that's going to help you reduce the ageing. Absolutely other. right, Joe. because walking, um, stressing the bones is what women need to do. That helps keep that bone strength up. Well, mm. exercise has to be something you enjoy as well. Don't you agree? I love Pilates and I also run probably a bit too much. I don't think it's great, as you said, as you age for well, the bones. The, the important point is you don't have to do a heap. Just one hour of muscle strength a week has huge benefits for our longevity and our quality of life. And as you say, Joe. It doesn't have to be enrolling in a gym and lifting weights all the time. Lifting shopping bags is fine. A good session in the garden, all this counts. And what you don't want is to think to yourself, I can't do a big session, so then I won't do anything. Mm. Any little bit counts. That's what I always tell myself. As we make our way through the silly season, there's lots of things that can put us off balance as well. So how about a masterclass in the art of staying upright? Here's Vicky Little. <laughs> Balance is the single most important thing you can do for your fitness. Falls are the most common cause of injury death. That's just from slipping or tripping over. And because our balance deteriorates as we get older, staying steady on your feet is critical. The 
test of balance is to see how long you can stand on one leg. First with your eyes open and then closed. If you're under 40, then you should be able to last 45 seconds with eyes open and 15 seconds with eyes closed. If you're over 50, 41 seconds open and 8 seconds closed. Over 60, 32 seconds open and 4 seconds closed. And if you're over 70, then you should last 22 seconds with eyes open and 3 seconds closed. This test is really important because it is so taxing. By removing the vision, the information sent to the brain to keep you upright is gone. So you have to work harder to find that stability. And if you want to take it up a notch, adding a stability ball is a great challenge. You don't have to use a ball. Arms are coming up, one leg is back. Standing on one leg, you're tipping over like a seesaw and then lifting up using that core. It's going to work your core stabilizers, your glutes. A few reps of those are really going to work your balance. Moving your eye line and your body at the same time isn't as easy as it looks. It's a real test of balance. Give it a try. So when you think about fitness, don't just think weights and running. Think balance. It really is the key to a longer and stronger life. You know, I'm not sure I could stand on one leg for 45 seconds with my eyes closed. Like, I've got pretty good balance, but the eyes closed, that seems like a long time. It is, and especially with your eyes closed, a lot of work goes into standing still, or walking, I guess, for that matter. And I assume that's why police test a person's sobriety by getting them to walk heel to toe in a straight line. Well, that's absolutely right, Jack, because a few too many drinks can definitely give you the wobbles. And vision and hearing problems, other fall risk factors, as are some of the medications that we take. My go-to, Nick, is always keeping that meditation balance going across the year. And over the Christmas New Year period, trying to, Joe, not always successfully watch what I eat and drink, for sure. I feel like out of all of us, you're the person that is definitely more likely to stay on that. I huh? think that's a good perception I've created, Dad. <laughs> uh, Jack, I'm Gaggy, not <laughs> You've obviously got to know me well very I've got, quickly. I've got Jack fooled, I think. <laughs> well, this year, heinz has been on a personal wellness quest to seek out the therapies that work best for him. He's been in freezing ice baths, red-hot saunas, hyperbaric chambers, you name it. And as we're looking at staying steady on our feet, this week is all about bringing heinz into perfect alignment. I'm a huge fan of a great massage. Deep tissue, Reiki, hot stone, shiatsu, and a good sports massage really hits the spot. And although these styles loosen up the muscles and provide fantastic relaxation, I'm keen to try a different type of hands-on body work. One that's built on balancing the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional elements to restore energy in the body. And it's done fully clothed. So if you would lean to the left and across to the right, as I just evaluate your sacroiliac joint. Thank you. And have a lie on your back. Andy, what is zero balancing? It's this really lovely session of body work, hands-on treatment, helping balance both the energy and the structure of the skeleton. So to understand that, you could think of your body as a sailing boat and your energy or vitality is the wind. And we want the wind to fill our sails so we cruise away through life and navigate obstacles and difficulties. But often we're out of sorts, we're floundering, we might be hurting. And we could say that the boat and the wind have lost their relationship. And so zero balancing is trimming your sails. Dr. Fritz Smith in America in the 1970s was combining his experience of osteopathy and acupuncture. And he developed this lovely modality from that combination of working with the physical structure of a skeleton, but also appreciating its energy, and discovered a way to treat both simultaneously. And he had no name for it, so people went to get Fritz, which is his first name. And after some years, someone in the in his practice, got off the table, stood up and said, oh, I feel balanced back to zero, meaning in equilibrium. And uh, he said, that's it, I found the name. Can you feel tension in bones much like you'd be able to feel a knot in a muscle? Absolutely. For example, I'll and I make contact with your ribs, 
with the bones in my fingers and I can tell by evaluating this ninth rib that the right hand side has a little more tension, a little less flexibility. You can think of it like all the injuries, the history, even your poor posture, your, you know, stuff we carry basically, tension. Some of it's deeper than the soft tissue, it's right in the skeleton. And bones can carry memories and feelings and stuck energies for years sometimes, which we may not realize. We only tend to appreciate our bones if they're hurting, and that's quite severe. They've had a fracture or a break usually. The rest of the time we just take them for granted, but if they are supported to relax and unblock, then everything else feels better with it. Apart from that density in the bone, is there anything else you can feel or experience? Yeah, absolutely. I'm evaluating the range of motion here at the cervical spine to see if your neck is free, and it is now in every way. To feel embodied, to be connected to oneself, is to really notice everything about how you feel, as well as think and all your sensation. And so part of a treatment for me is getting connected or helping the client feel very connected. So their mind, their body, their emotions are not separate. They're all you, they're all one person. And if we can feel like we're one complete integrated person, then we're just happier. We're more, we're more healthy. So Luke, if you would have a lovely big breath, a sigh. <sighs> No expectations is exactly what you need going into zero balancing. I'd build a story in my head that it would be similar to a massage, but with some verbal cues for some emotional clearing or healing. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Although it's quite a light therapy, it really hits pressure points on your bones that feel really firm and, and, and quite a release. Now, not just a physical release from the body, but without Andy saying anything, an emotional clarity coming with it too. So after the session, I feel taller, I feel lighter. I feel like I'm leading with my chest with really good confidence, but I also feel really happy. And for no particular reason, I feel like I could take on anything in my day. Well, I think it's fair to say we're all united by one thing, and that's chasing balance in life. Now, I'm interested to know what all of you want to do better in 2023, starting with you, Jack. Uh, I'm determined to have better food experiences as I cook dinner and as I do that with my daughter, Willow, as well. I really hate cooking, but I want to change that mindset to really embrace it and create some better memories in the kitchen mm. with my daughter, Willow. Well, I, I'm not too bad in the kitchen, but my resolution is actually going to be the same as it has been for the last five years, which is I have to learn to touch type, finally. <laughs> So random. <laughs> really not that hard. No. <laughs> I imagine for a doctor, you're always doing things on the computer, though, so you, to lessen the time, you do need to do it quicker. It's so embarrassing in front of patients. <laughs> Hunt and pick. <laughs> Mine is actually to try and work less, to learn to say no to the things that you don't want to do, mm. rather than being a yes person all the time. Sure. Just a bit more me time with the kids. Yeah. Well, I like it, Jack. Now, well done. Well, prawns are being shelled and Christmas chooks are being prepped right around the country. Up next, we'll look at the power of food that should be popping up on everyone's dinner table at any time of the year. We're back after this. Well, this weekend, families and friends are gathering for the annual Christmas feast. Nanette, you still have the traditional roast you told us a bit earlier. How about you, Jack? We're a seafood family, actually, because our house is down the coast, so we tend to try to catch our own crayfish. Doesn't always yes. work with it. Yeah, <laughs> so usually we have one that my brother or my dad's caught on the Christmas table. Oh, that is beautiful. Mm. We've caught our own too at the market. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is, you know, that's traumatic enough. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. forever that's to get true. your crayfish at the market. <laughs> but you know what's a truly underappreciated, hard-working food each Christmas? It's nuts. I don't mind a nut, actually. I like a salted <laughs> cashew, but only if it's with a wine. Uh, I mean, I love the chocolate-coated almonds. Does that count? Yes, it <laughs> yes. all counts. A really decadent little treat any time of the year. Mm. In the Northern Hemisphere, Christmas is all about the sights and smell mm. of chestnuts roasting on a fire, which is beautiful. While our hot summer makes that sound not quite so tasty, the latest 
health advice is that we should all be going mad for nuts. We all know the cravings. A morning coffee, a mid-morning croissant and the 3pm chocolate bar. But for Deakin University's lead researcher for nutrition, Dr Tan, well, he just can't go past his daily snack of nuts. I do have my nuts regularly. I do have a, a jar of nuts in my office at home always. My favourite is cashew and almonds. I, I eat them on a daily basis. Not only do they taste good, Dr Tan's obsession extends to their health benefits. So nuts are very high in nutrients such as unsaturated fats, which are healthy fat for our body. They are also high in protein, fiber, and depending on the types of nuts we are talking about, they can have their very unique nutrient profile. For example, almonds and peanuts are very high in vitamin E. Walnuts are traditionally known to be good for the brain. Brazil nuts are very high in selenium and cashew is very high in copper. But generally speaking, all nuts are good sources of all these nutrients as well. So if we have a combination of different nuts in the diet, then we will have the benefit of all the different nutrients coming from different nuts as well. But while nuts are full of things that are good for us, Dr Tan's research also found that a diet of nuts can improve brain function. We discovered that 15 grams per day of nuts has been associated with better cognition in terms of your immediate memory, so meaning how fast you recall information given to you. Verbal fluency, how many things you can retrieve from your memory, and also processing and attention to the tasks that you're doing. And we also found that 30 grams per day of nuts is associated with better long-term memory. A single serving of nuts is about 20 almonds, 15 cashews, 10 Brazil nuts or 10 walnuts. And every variety is as powerful as the next. There is common practice where people soak their nuts before they consume it. And the reason behind this practice is that nuts can be high in phytate, what we call um, phytate. So it is a, a phosphorus compound that you find in you know, all types of seeds, and nuts and legumes. And when you consume them, they basically bind to your protein and also bind to all the minerals that you consume. And when they are bound together, your body cannot absorb them. But interestingly, um, based on available study to date, uh, what happened was that when you soak the nut, you have to soak them in salt water. So you actually increase the salt content of the nuts and you have to dry them after you soak them. So that's what we call the activation of the nuts. And when you do that, you actually increase the concentration of phytate. So it has been shown to be not very useful when it comes to nuts. So different level of processing does make a, a slight difference when it comes to nutrient availability from nuts. Raw nuts tend to be softer in the texture, hence maybe more suitable for older adults. Roasted nuts, some people like the crunch of it, and research has shown that if you roast the nuts, you actually release the good fat more. Almost half of older Aussies don't include nuts in their diet, but eating just a handful a day does even more than boost the brain. What we found was that when you add nuts into a meal, especially those with high carbohydrate content, the high level of fat and protein from nuts can actually help you reduce how your blood glucose level go up after a big meal. On the other hand, when we look at nuts as snacks, they tend to reduce your hunger as well in between meals. So what that means is that you probably will wait slightly longer before you eat the next meal. We still uh, recommend people to inc incorporate all types of nuts in order to increase the variety in the diet. Of all the healthy things we're told to eat daily, nuts would have to be the easiest and yummiest. Oh, well, I couldn't agree more. And talking about being good for brains, my dog, Rosie, <laughs> she's known for sneaking a walnut out of the cupboard and taking it into <laughs> the garden, cracking it open and eats it. We just find the empty shells in the garden. <laughs> we need to capture that. On, that's extraordinary. It's just so walnuts. sweet. Obviously makes her smart. She's found out where the cupboard is and she noses her way in and just takes one. It's Aww. gorgeous. And, of course, nuts are actually a much healthier choice than a chocolate bar if you're partial to those sneaky in-between meals. 
Christmas snacks. That's impressive, Rosie. Yeah. 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 What sort of dog? Uh, she's a border collie poodle. A border do I call them collie wally doodles. Who cracks walnuts <laughs> and eats them in the garden. Well, coming up next, we're all ears over Dr Nick's latest health advice. Uh, sorry, what was that, Dart? It's not that <laughs> joke time. <laughs> at all. Plus, there's hope on our ocean's horizon as the war on plastic starts to pay off. That's coming up next on The House of Wellness. Now, Joe, we love unusual stories here on the House of Wellness <laughs> and all the better when there's an animal involved, I have to mm, say. I can feel a quirky story coming on with an animal, I'm tipping. Yeah, you're on the money, <laughs> Joe. I know you love your music and the right track can get you moving. Mm -hmm. You like to dance, don't love you? Love it, yes. love dancing, yes. You, you don't go to the beach. There's a lot of things you don't do, but, but uh, oh, dancing's right dancing. in your wheelhouse. Yes. Now, it seems humans aren't the only ones who like to get up on the dance floor and get moving. A study out of the University of Tokyo has found that rats... Like, that's right, rats, like humans, move their little furry bodies to a great beat, Joe. OK, well, this is astounding. They actually tested humans and rats with the same music tracks at different tempos and found that both species nodded their heads at the same time, exactly the same rhythm. Amazing. But I do not wish to share a dance floor with a rat. <laughs> And no, I've thank never, you. And I've never got the rhythm part right either, <laughs> so I'll take some tips on that front. Now, I've no idea what that information says about rats, but the fact that they can even hear the tempo, that, that to me is extraordinary. It really, does it suggest they're smarter than we think? Probably. I don't know. If nothing else, they have great hearing <laughs> and something that's high on the listening list for Dr Nick Carr, ears, I mean. Here he is with a topic that can be a bit gooey but essential for healthy hearing. What do you know in the human body that can be any colour from grey to yellow, brown, orange or even red? <laughs> well, the answer is earwax. Yes, that stuff that's repulsive to some people but a source of fascination to others. Mainly, in my experience, people who are determined to try and dig it out of their own ears. Earwax is made of a natural fatty substance called cerumen, which is secreted by special glands in the outer ear and its job is to protect the delicate skin of the ear canal. So it collects all the dead cells, germs, debris and dust and creates what's called ear wax. Now, nature is pretty clever and the skin of the ear canal grows towards the outside, carrying the wax with it and it all just gets washed off. What do we do? We get a cotton wool bud and shove it back along the conveyor belt. Oh, along the way, scratching the ear canal, causing inflammation and infection. Hmm, good job. The best way to treat ears is leave them alone. No cotton buds, no toothpicks, nothing at all. Like your mum told you, nothing smaller than your elbow goes in your ears. Now, sometimes, of course, nature isn't quite up to the job and the wax gets stuck. And that's where I come in. A few wax drops, squirt of warm water and mostly job done. And I love doing it. <laughs> Someone comes in thinking they've gone deaf. Ten minutes, they can hear again. Good. Every now and then with really recalcitrant wax, you might need a specialist to suck it out. But one treatment you don't need is a thing called ear candling. Now, this is a form of alternative therapy where they light the end of a hollow candle and pop the other end in your ear. The theory is the burning candle causes a suction effect drawing the rubbish out of your ear canal, which would be great if it works. Unfortunately, the science shows no benefit and it can cause harm, such as burns. Oh, and the rubbish in the candle after it's finished burning? Turns out that gunk isn't from your ear, but it is wax. It's candle wax. For me, the most interesting thing about earwax is that it comes in two types. Wet, which is more common in Caucasians like myself, and the dry type that's more common in Asia. <laughs> now, so what I hear you cry? Fair question. Well, it turns out that anthropologists can track human migration from following earwax. Amazing! 
Over the years, there have been many creative uses for earwax. The Romans used to believe that it was good for scorpion stings. And before the invention of wax thread, seamstresses used to use their own earwax to stop their thread from fraying. And 200 years ago, the very first lip balm was made from, you guessed it, earwax. Ugh. <laughs> I think I'll just stick with this one. OK, earwax as lip balm. It's gross, I'm sorry. Oh, I think we're all going to agree <laughs> on that. Now, I was always told, Jackie, that you should put nothing smaller than your elbow in your ear. So cotton buds are a big no-no, I'm guessing. Exactly. Cotton buds are just one example of single-use plastic that's on its way out. New South Wales recently banned the buds, except for certain medical uses. Yes, yeah, some major supermarkets have also paused mm. their soft plastic recycling that seem to be going well on the outside, but that comes as a real blow. Many people who generally don't want to see their plastic going back into landfill. It's a real mess, isn't it? And it's mind-blowing to think of the amount of single-use plastic that we use. It's about 60 kilograms per person a year, and that's more than any other country in the world. That's a huge stat. Yeah, you hear those figures, Jack, don't you? And it's hard not to feel overwhelmed by the problem, but we have some good news at the moment. The war on plastic is seriously starting to pay off. I'm Denise Hardesty, I'm a research scientist at CSIRO and I've been working on plastic pollution for around 15 years. We started this work by going out and surveying every 100 kilometres around Australia's coastline. What we set out to do was to actually measure change. Is there any change in how much plastic we're finding on Australia's coastline? And what we found is that over the course of just six years, we found a 29% decline in overall total plastic on our shores. So that's a huge change, nearly 30% in just six years. And we did that by going out and surveying around the country and then actually talking to councils to find out what they're doing. Our goal wasn't just to say how much plastic is out there or has it changed. Importantly, we wanted to know why. What's different? What do we see in those areas where there is a change, where there is that decrease? And so what we find is that when we make it easy, people really want to do the right thing. Have the infrastructure in place. Give people cash for containers. Have bins on beaches. Those things really make a difference. I think it's really important to design with what I call a legacy mindset. Think for the long term. Think about what is this thing that I'm buying going to turn into or what could it become? We're really returning back to some of the materials that we used to use in products 30, 40 years ago. Some of the solutions are actually really simple. One of the exciting things happening in Australia is the bringing together of different data sources into a national portal. And this allows us to not just see what's happening on the local level, but to scale that up to see the national picture and to measure that change through time and with lots of different community groups participating. In addition, we're using technologies like smart sensors and cameras so that we can use technology to better understand how much and what types of waste are in the environment or so that we can manage it before it gets lost out into our oceans. One hope for the future is that I can go to any beach anywhere around the world and not find evidence of our human plastic waste. Well, this is great news. We've just found out that scientists are reporting a 30% reduction in plastic pollution on Australia's coast, which is just outstanding to hear. Mm. Oh, it's so great to hear that all this effort is maybe coming to some fruition. Right now, we're breaking out the bikinis or cover all rashies, whatever you might be wearing to the beach. I don't wear any of that. <laughs> um, but as you know... <laughs> Nothing at all, is I don't go in the yeah. water. Oh, OK. Glad it's a bit of a stretch for me to find my bathers. I don't know where they are. I, don't, I prefer a sea breeze and a cocktail on the beach, to be honest. <laughs> yes. I actually love the water and surfing and at our place a sign of summer is all the wetsuits hanging along the clothesline and just as we worry about recycling plastic Aussie icon Rip Curl has found a way to turn discarded wetsuits into a whole new form of fun. Take a look. It's hard to believe that right up until the 60s surfers were braving even the coldest waves in nothing but a pair of togs. 
These days, wetsuits are a second skin for any serious surfer. Living in Victoria, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of warm water, so so having having a, a good wetsuit is is a must and so every surfer down here will generally have have a bunch of wetsuits there's just one problem neoprene the waterproof synthetic rubber that most wetsuits are made from is next to impossible to recycle being a surfer you do have a strong affinity with the environment and with your, with your local environment so doing a, a small thing to help reduce your negative impact on that environment and help keep our oceans cleaner is something that's really important. As one of the largest manufacturers of wetsuits in the world, Rip Curl have become increasingly aware of their environmental footprint. I think in particular in the last uh, decade, the business has been on a journey to ensure that everything that we do within the business um, is more of a closed loop and more sustainable. And a lot of it's been driven by our consumers. Rip Curl's environmental social governance manager, Shasta O'Loughlin, has spent years searching for a way to keep customers' old wetsuits out of landfill. But until recently, nothing had stuck. Neoprene's a really hard material. You think someone surfs probably two to three years in the same suit, um, it's going in, in the ocean, which is, obviously has salt. Um, a lot of people wee in their wetsuits, so it's con they're contaminated materials. So to try and find something that we can actually put it into is a challenge. Yes, it's been a holy grail of ours for many years. We've used the, um, the wetsuits for a range of things over the decades, including archery butts, punching bags and the like, but we just had way too many wetsuits. It wasn't until last year that the company finally found a long-term solution by partnering up with international recycling company TerraCycle. Our core business and uh, what we're most known for is uh, the recycling program that we run for products that are typically not recyclable and uh, would go to landfill. Products like coffee capsules, toothbrushes and toothpaste tubes, razors, toys, you name it. Like There's so many of uh, them and now we are very proud to partner with Ripple to make wetsuits recyclable in Australia. Thanks to TerraCycle's unique global resources, all Australians can now bring in or mail old wetsuits of any brand to select Rip Curl stores, where they'll go on to serve a surprising new purpose. The second life essentially is child playground matting that you see in um, various play parks. So it's not the top layer of the matting, it's not the coloured sort of nice um, matting that you see because wetsuits are all different colours um, so it's basically the underlay so sort of like carpet underlay um, that sits underneath and gives us that soft cushioning feel um, for, for safety if children fall down. When I first heard about the program I thought it, it was it's a great way to get surfers involved with you know, reducing our impact on the environment. You know, obviously being a mum and, and having kids and going to the playground, the, the ones with the uh, soft wool matting are always uh, always a benefit. So I think it's a, it's a great way to, to, to reuse something that would normally go to landfill. The program itself has had such great response from our customers. It feels really good to be able to deliver something that we're so passionate about. And now we want to expand globally. So I'm in discussions on a European and a US expansion on this. And I think that's what makes TerraCycle such a great partner because they do have that global uh, footprint. We need to change our mindset and, uh, and think that everything can be recycled. The question is like, who is willing to, 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 to pay for it and, uh, and run those, uh, those schemes? Um, and are we willing to innovate and look for local uh, companies that can take the material and turn it into something useful?
Christmas decorations have been lighting up streets everywhere for weeks now. Or is that months, Sir Jack? It seems to me it's getting <laughs> earlier and earlier. Look, I agree with you, but I don't mind it. Who doesn't love <laughs> a bit of colour and party lights? And we Melburnians especially love our colourful street art. In the US, they're using it to make the country's roads much safer. Cities around the US have been painting colourful murals on intersections, crossings and sidewalks. It's seen a 50% decrease in the rate of crashes involving pedestrians and a 17% decrease in crashes overall. Well, I absolutely love this idea, Jack. And the wonderful asphalt art makes people slow down, look at their streets differently, because who couldn't use an extra dose of brightness while taking a walk or a drive around town? And anything that stops them staring at their phones mm. has to be a good thing. Oh, I totally agree. And, you know, it reminds me of the positive talk messages that started springing up. Do you remember on yeah. Melbourne streets and footpaths during COVID lockdowns? You know, they lifted everyone's mood and they even saw a couple fall in love. One of the great that? stories on the House of Wellness, <laughs> uh, Joe. That's our show for today and indeed for 2022. To Joe, to Dr Nick and to Jackie, thanks for what's been a really fantastic and enjoyable year. Oh, thanks to you, Darcy, and to all of you, here's to a wonderful 2023. To you and your family, best wishes for the festive season. Stay happy, stay safe. Until next time, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas. <laughs>